This is week 64. And it's amazing. It's now been 14 months that we have been bringing to you this webinar to talk about the global pandemic with a local perspective. And today I'm excited to be your moderator, Yvonne Lewis, and the co-director of the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center Community Corps. And this webinar is brought to you, sponsored by the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center, the Flint Center for Health Equity Solutions, and the Michigan Prevention Research Center. We're excited today to be able to bring you such great information. And I want to tell you, you want to stay tuned. There's some rich information that you'll be able to receive today. We need your help. We always need your input. So we're going to ask you today, if you would, if you have questions, to please put those questions in the queue. There's a little button down at the end of your screen for Q&A um, and put those questions in the Q&A and we will be happy to answer those questions for you. We also ask you to email us at info at hfrcc.org, info at hfrcc.org. You can do that before the webinar, you can do it during the webinar, and you can also send us that information at any time that you have questions that you want us to answer. We will be very happy to respond to those questions for you. Today, we want to remind you that we have great partners who are just waiting to answer your questions behind the scene. Representatives from the Genesee County Health Department, uh, representatives from the Genesee Health System, as well as representatives from our partner organizations. Today, we have a great webinar for you. As I mentioned, we're going to be talking about a new topic today, PTSD. I'm not going to describe that for you because you'll hear more about it in a little bit. We're going to hear from the governor's office with an update from our own Gary Jones. We're going to look at the policy update brief, the policy brief that gives us an update on health policies. And we're going to hear today from the mayor's office. We have some really important tips that we're going to give you during our roundtable today. So please stay tuned at this point. If you know of a friend, have them like us uh, on Facebook, invite them to be a part of this webinar today so that they can get this information as well. First up today, we're going to be talking to Gary Jones. We know, Gary, that the governor has made some decisions and um, that will make our community more open again, if you will. We remember a year ago, we were completely shut down. And so now the governor has made some very important decisions that will affect all of us. So Gary, will you please give us an update on those items? Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Yvonne. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so you may have heard of the Back to Normal Plan, uh, our administration released in late April, uh, outlining intermediate goals for our state. Uh, as we work to vaccinate eligible Michiganders. We recalibrated our Back to Normal plan so that it is composed of two steps, the first of which we took on June 1st. Under the new ME MDHHS epidemic order, outdoor capacity limits are lifted and capacity limits for indoor gatherings increase to 50%. People who are not fully vaccinated must continue to mask up indoors, but can occur at 50% capacity through June. The curfew for bars and restaurants also ended June 1st. In July, we will take the final step in the back to normal plan. We will lift the broad mask and gathering orders and will no longer impose broad mitigation measures unless unanticipated circumstances arise. We may have targeted orders to protect vulnerable populations, uh, just as an example of that. Um, earlier this week, uh, the governor and lieutenant governor joined the attorney general, secretary of state, uh, Congressman Kildee, and the Genesee County Sheriff in Flint for an expungement event uh, since the governor signed the clean slate bills into law. Upon taking office, uh, Governor Whitmer worked with the Republican majority legislature to pass crucial clean slate legislation that will help thousands of Michiganders gain employment, housing, and education. Um, also, the governor recently issued an executive directive uh, to help bridge the digital divide by establishing the Michigan High-Speed Internet Office to make high-speed internet more affordable and accessible. COVID-19 has only confirmed how the lack of high-speed internet access can cause too many to engage in online learning, to use telemedicine to seek needed health care, uh, to search for a new job, or to take advantage of all the online resources. Uh, also recently, the governor and the Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs took an important step to address health care disparities 
and improve equity in the delivery of health care to all Michigan residents. Last year, upon recommendation by the Michigan Coronavirus Task Force on Racial Disparities, the governor issued an executive direct directive which directed LAURA, or Licensing and Regulatory Affairs, to begin drafting rules that incorporated an implicit bias training requirement. So this announcement caps nearly 11 months of collaboration and engagement with licensees, insurance providers, hospitals, healthcare associations, legislators, state agencies, higher education and community and advocacy groups. Uh, and lastly, I would like to extend a huge congratulations to the class of 2021. Uh, we are all very proud of you uh, and ready to support you as you pursue your dreams. Uh, and of course, I um, always like to recommend everyone to refer to the uh, catch-all websites, michigan.gov backslash COVID vaccine and michigan.gov backslash coronavirus, uh, still the best catch-all website for everything going on. Thank you, Gary. I just want, before you, before you have to take off and leave us today, something that you've said throughout your conversation today has helped us to see, we're, we've been focusing on COVID, but you've talked about so many other things that this has impacted, like the internet, uh, the, the divide there, as well as opening up businesses to expand our economy again. And so even though we focus on COVID, there are a lot of other things that are impacted by this, even the equity issue that you just raised. Absolutely, absolutely. Yep. Um, and we're going to continue to, uh, you know, work to address uh, these these different things. Uh, we actually, um, one announcement that I didn't get a chance to, to mention was the economic plan uh, that the governor introduced uh, yesterday, uh, actually to um, uh, get people uh, back to work, to get Michiganders back to work, uh, but also to get them bigger paychecks while they're going back to work in the process too as well and utilizing uh, those federal funds that we received about six months ago. Uh, in order to uh, help do that. But then also a really, really important piece, um, and I won't spend too much time on it, uh, but getting folks access to quality and affordable childcare. Um, we have a lot of people in the state uh, who would actually love uh, to go back to work um, now, but uh, there are some challenges um, you know, that was posed uh, during the pandemic uh, with making sure that people can not only access uh, child care, uh, but, but be able to afford it too as well. So uh, the governor did draft um, inside of her budget proposal a plan uh, in order to address that, um, that piece for uh, parents who need it. Thank you, Gary. And we appreciate you being there on the ground uh, in, the, in the governor's ear because you also take things back from the voices of Flint and Genesee County. So we certainly appreciate that. And you mentioned getting back to normal, uh, yeah. what we may call the new normal. It's going to be an interesting thing. And so while we're on our way to that, we want to talk to the Genesee County Health Department because there's some things and measures that we need to be sure are still in place. And yes, we're talking about reopening and getting back to normal. But we still want to remind you that we are in the midst of a pandemic. It has not been uh, declared over yet. So we're going to ask uh, Sherelle Brown if she would come forward and just talk to us a little bit about some of the things that's happening in the Genesee County Health Department perspective, especially in light of this reopening plan. And I think I did see Dr. Hacker. Welcome, Dr. Hacker. We're glad you joined us as well. Good morning, everyone. So as Gary did mention, um, there are new mask requirements. Um, we are still not out of the woods, so it's important that although masks aren't being enforced for those who are fully vaccinated, that we continue to wear masks in you know, vulnerable settings. As of this week, if you're two and older and you have been fully vaccinated, you're not required to wear a mask indoors or outdoors. Um, but it's still important to stay protected because we have those children who are under 12 who are not um, eligible for a vaccine yet that we care for and that we interact with after being in establishments with people who are not and who are vaccinated. So it's important to continue wearing your mask. Um, next slide, please. And another reason why I say it's important is although the cases are decreasing, we still have 59 cases reported in Genesee County this past week. And some of those cases include uh, variant strains and our variants came after the vaccine was developed. 
So some of those strains can break through the vaccine. So we still encourage you to continue getting vaccinated, continue wearing your mask, continue social distancing, and just being safe for your family, your friends, and those who have not been vaccinated yet. Next slide. And also, in order to know if you have COVID, you have to continue being tested. We need testing so that we can identify those variants because some of the variants impact our health in ways that are more serious than the original strain. So we encourage you to continue going out into the community at the sites that are available to you, Word of Life Church, Bethel United Methodist Church, Macedonia Baptist Church, as well as your local Walgreens and Rite Aid. We also have Hamilton Community Health Network and Genesee Community Health Center where you can go and be tested free of charge whether you have symptoms or not. And I do want to let you know that we are, you know, still making great strides in getting our uh, county residents vaccinated. Ages 16 and older, we have reached about 50% of our residents becoming vaccinated. So that's great news. And we want to get that number up as high as possible. Uh, Genesee County Health Department has administered over 78,000 of those. And you'll see on the screen uh, the dashboard. You can also visit GCHD to look further into those details of who's been vaccinated, what vaccine was given, and how we're doing with that. Next slide. And I do want to remind you of our upcoming clinics through the Genesee County Health Department. Today we are at Guadalupe, Our Lady of Guadalupe Church will be here to 2 p.m. If you have not received your vaccine and you're available to come, we do encourage you to get here. Um, next week, starting Tuesday, can we go back? <laughs> Next week, starting Tuesday, we'll be at Lake Fenton High School from 3.30 to 6.30. And at that clinic, you are able to do childhood vaccines. So if you haven't um, got your children caught up, you can go to Lake Fenton High School. We do encourage you to call the health department just to make an appointment regarding what vaccine your child will need. And next Wednesday, we'll have a early in the day clinic as well as a later Taylor in the day clinic for those who have to work and children who are still in school. So at Grand Blank High School will be available to work in parents and school age children from 3.30 to 6.30, 12 and up who can receive Pfizer and will also be at um, Central Church of the Nazarene. Thursday, we're available at Flint Southwestern in the evening from 3.30 to 6.30, as well as Shiloh. That uh, clinic will be given 8.30 to 6.30. So have a full day to make it to two different locations to get your vaccine. We want to get our children 12 and older vaccinated so that they can attend sports and have fun with their friends during the summer. And next Friday, we'll be back at Guadalupe. Um, all these appointments all of these uh, clinics are no appointment. So you don't need to pre-register. You can just come to any listed clinic to get your vaccine, whichever works for you. We are still vaccinating our homebound um, residents. So if you know anyone who has not received their vaccine, who is homebound, we encourage you to um, give us a call at 810-344-4800 so that we're able to serve them. Thank you so much, Sherelle. And it's really exciting to know that you're out at the clinic right now. We can hear activities going on at the clinic. So again, if you know somebody that needs to get the vaccination today and, and has made that decision, please encourage them. They can go today over Our Lady of Guadalupe, which is located on Carpenter Road. And Sherelle will be there. She can greet you and, and help make sure that you're well taken care of. Want to invite our, our panelists now for the round table. We're going to take this next few moments and talk to you about some of the specifics about things that are happening. Dr. Reynolds is going to join us along with Dr. Hacker. Uh, Lottie, uh, please join us as well. And we want to just, just um, look at the fact that we have all of these opportunities that are available to us in the community. And, and Dr. Hackett, I just want to start with you to say as a health officer, how you have listened to community. I think this is a real thing today. I want everybody to really understand how important your voice is because when you listen to the activities or the things that are happening, it's because the voices of community have been heard. And you're in a lot of places, Dr. Hackett. Help us to understand some of the things that the health department is doing to make this happen for us. 
Oh, that's a that's a, a lovely and broad um, intro there. So thank you. Um, I'm going to start with good news. I think a couple people may have already heard it, but I do think it's it's great news. So I have asked our epidemiologists to start doing a trend data because when you have over a year of data, um, it you know the the impact isn't as great. So I asked them to do like a three week preceding seven day average um, and then the current week. And so this is as of the weekly update through um, May 31st, but um, the number of cases with unknown race continued to drop. And this previous week, it was only 21% of the cases referred last week had unknown race, whereas um, it was up to 39% since the beginning of the pandemic. So that is a huge improvement. Um, and interestingly, the number of cases then identified actually was going down uh, proportionately um, in communities of color and up in Caucasian. So it would appear by my uh, rather quick look at some of this that a lot of those unknown race were actually in white folks. So it's so I just thought that was very interesting, but great news that it's down to 21% of our more recent ones. So people are really making the effort and it's starting to show that we had that data. So sorry about my bad profile here, but I'm going to try and pull some of this other stuff together. Um, I know that, you know, everyone's really aware, aware of um, the great drop in cases that we've had, but, you know, you, you go along and you think you've got you know, a team of all these like brilliant people in our health department and in our communities. And then I, read, I didn't even read it, I just kind of glanced at it and thought, didn't even think of that. So like two days ago in Apple News of all places, it said that if you look at the number of cases compared to the number of people who aren't vaccinated, we're actually still at the January levels. So they're, they're much higher. And I'd be very curious how many other people have had that discussion because I had not actually thought of that really. I was just like looking at our overall numbers and saying, Oh, good. It's trending down, trending down, trending down. But that's as our vaccine rates are going up, the pool of people who are vulnerable to this, um, you know, gets smaller. And so the case rate is actually quite high if you just knock out the people who are vaccinated. So the, the really great news, though, is the changes that the CDC made were based on some very recent studies that showed two different things. One, when you say that the vaccines are about 95% effective for the mRNA, Moderna and the Pfizer, that's about 5% of people who are still at risk of getting an asymptomatic or mild moderate case. But when you look at those people's risk of giving it to others, the people who are unvaccinated, the children, the elderly, the people who've just not decided yet to get it, that's where that whole change of masking use really was stemming from. It's two different studies that showed that in vaccinated people, while we may have some mild symptoms, our vaccine burden in our respiratory passages isn't enough to spread it. So it's very, very unlikely that you would spread it to anyone. So that's why that change came about. And then also the second thing that was being published and known is that, so they have these things, you know, the in vitro versus in vivo, and it just means when they test it in a lab, compared to when they tested in real life. So there was a lot of concern originally with the variants um, that the vaccines that we have now would not be as effective, effective enough against some of these variants that arose. And the studies are showing that actually in the human body, they are effective. So that's why there was a lot more comfort with saying that people who are fully vaccinated two weeks after your full last vaccine dose, that we can feel comfortable now you know, going out, I feel like the word that comes to my mind is exposing ourselves, you know, because it just seems like you're, oh, you're so exposed now when you go into a store and, you know, they don't require, I dropped my pet off today and, and um, it says, you know, if you don't have a, if you are fully vaccinated, you don't need to wear a mask. And it was like, you know, like this. <laughs> so, so it's, um, it is, it is safe. It's starting, it's safe to go back now. Um, and so when you are in a mixed group though, when you're in a healthcare setting, where people are immunosuppressed, it's always going to be, you need to wear masks. 
Um, I think that should be something going forward that we do to protect people against flu and other um, respiratory transmission of diseases. But right now that, that is mandated. Also shared public transportation, you still have to wear masks. Um, and, you know, and if you feel uncomfortable without a mask, put the mask on. So like my husband um, does not feel comfortable going into a large store and so he keeps his mask on despite being fully vaccinated. So it's like you have to do what is comfortable for you. It's been, you know, and we're talking about PTSD now. And so it has been quite a year for everybody. And, um, and so I think people should recognize that if wearing a mask helps reduce your stress, even if you're fully vaccinated, then just keep the mask on. So that's where I'm going to for me. Yeah, or, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hackard. And I, I saw Dr. Reynolds kind of chuckle a couple of times and, and smile because he continued to say those layers of protection. So Dr. Reynolds, the mic's open for you. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, as a pediatrician and a grandfather, I have to model behavior for my almost four-year-old grandsons. And so I will keep a mask on. Uh, also, Sometimes when you get in the habit of not wearing a mask, you forget to carry one or two with you, one for you and one for somebody else, and you step into a setting where you do need to wear a mask, you're unprepared. So I would urge everybody, keep three or four masks in your pocket. You see how I crept up on the number. <laughs> uh, and, and as others have said earlier, and this is the pediatrician in me, uh, children 12 and under are not yet eligible for vaccine, plus those who have yet to be vaccinated. Uh, but we want to protect the 12 and under crowd. Uh, as others have said before, we don't do this for ourselves. We do this for our family, our neighborhood, uh, our community, for our coworkers, even the ones we don't like. Uh, and uh, for the children that we attend school with. So please, uh, get vaccinated. That's the essential component of protection, but wear a mask in those settings uh, where uh, it will definitely be beneficial and have one for your friends and enemies. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reynolds. Now, we, we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the things from the water crisis, but I do want to just reemphasize, we're talking about a new normal so before we weren't wearing masks and now we're told it's okay not to wear a mask, but the new normal is you do need to pay attention <laughs> and make, the, make good decisions about the environment. You mentioned once before Dr. Reynolds and you said, you know, you have to pay attention to your surroundings and if it gets to be uncomfortable, you make that decision. So I wanna thank Sherelle again, because she's out there and here are some vaccine sites that are available for us. There are testing sites that are available for us. Did we, did we miss something else? Uh, there was one thing before we get to some of the other issues about the water crisis. Sherelle, I wanted to ask you, there are other opportunities for community members to get some support for vaccinations if they're having an event. How would they go about doing that? Yes, so um, as I stated previously, we are partnered with Cur Curative Lab and it's located at 4100 Diplomat, um, South Saginaw Street at the Diplomat Building. And so you can contact Michael Watson via email. That's Michael Watson, W-A-T-S-O-N at Curative, C-R-U-A-T-I-V-E dot com to schedule an event to have vaccinations done. Um, I've been reached out to from various places within the community. I know there's plans for Juneteenth festivals and there's plans to have vaccinations at those. And if you want one, reach out to Michael. He should be able to help you. And if not, we'll step in as the health department and make it happen. Good. Thank you. I saw you nodding, Lottie, uh, when they said she said Juneteenth, because the city is very involved in that and making these opportunities available. Did you have something you want to add with that? I, I really just hope everybody comes out. This is, is shaping up to be a, a really big celebration. Um, the, the, the first year that Juneteenth is officially a holiday in the city of Flint. So we're super excited about everything that's planned, and we hope to see everybody out safely, but out. Thank you. Thank you, Lottie. I want to pivot a little bit now and talk a little bit about uh, some of the things that are related to the water crisis. Dr. Reynolds, you've been extremely involved in helping to lead the way and help the voices be heard with respect to some of the 
items in the lawsuit settlement. So I want to give you an opportunity to help us update, update us on what's going on with that. All right. Well, the most recent development and the biggest development has been that the manufacturer of this uh, metal analyzer, radiation emitting metal analyzer, uh, the manufacturer has written for the second time uh, to an attorney who's been using this equipment uh, improperly to cease and desist. Uh, this equipment was not designed for use on humans. Uh, it is, it had been modified uh, by a, a consultant to this attorney also. And once again, the manufacturer, uh, the name of which is Thermo Fisher Scientific, has said, do not use this equipment or even the modified equipment on humans. Now, I filed my objection uh, back in uh, late February, officially February 25th. The law firm Napoli and Skolnick, who were using this equipment, did not register and their registration was not active until February 25th. Now, by state law, every time they use this analyzer with it, without it being registered, they can be fined up to one I brought this to the attention of Laura. Uh, the complaint was filed uh, with my attorney, Val Washington, and we have yet to hear if there has been an investigation and what will follow. So this comes back to our theme uh, whereby people are supposed to have a voice that's listened to. They're supposed to have access, uh, even in a pandemic. It, should not take three months to get a response. Uh, but uh, these are the challenges uh, that we face. So we will continue to press. Now, why would people get the bone scan? They get it in hope of showing that there's, well, not in hope, but if there's bone, if there's lead in the bone where it stays for decades, uh, they're hoping that they will get a higher compensation. Let me be clear. Number one, the results of this scan belong to the attorney and his consultant. The results do not belong to the individual. The results of this scan, uh, you can't even have your doctor call uh, and get that information. Uh, and that's what kicked this whole thing off several months ago when a mother was not clear on the results, called the number, got recorded music, and then had her doctor call the number and got recorded music. And then they called uh, the Greater Flint Health Coalition's Child Health Care Access Program. And I bring these details up so you know how our community works together. Uh, there is a nurse on the staff there who just shot me an email and that started the ball rolling because I had no idea they were being allowed to do this. Uh, there's also the issue of informed consent. Usually for any procedure, a doctor or a staff member will give you a written informed consent, go over it with you and, and have you sign it. Well, this informed consent is inadequate, number one, because this is not an approved medical practice using, a, this is not using approved medical equipment. So uh, it's, I, I just sum it up and call it wrong and unethical. Uh, and there's an element of coercion there because many people are going through hard times and they figure, well, if I can get a little more money, uh, it will help. And it, it may, it's not worth it because it doesn't change anything that has to be done for our children, especially. They still need an assessment for school they need a developmental assessment. Uh, and uh, if there are other sources of lead in the house, now that we've finally gotten the water straightened out, if there are other sources of lead, that still needs to be addressed. So uh, as we used to say on the corner, don't go for the short money, go for the long money, and nothing is more valuable than your child. 
and yourself. And that's the long money. Thank you, Dr. Reynolds. Now, I know people are maybe asking, what is this device? Is there, can you give us the name of the device that they should be considering? Or should we come back and talk about that at a later date? <laughs> I'll just, I'll give you the brand name. It's a Nitan XL3T950 Gold with two Ds plus XRF Analyzer. Okay. And the short name is XL3T. XL3T. Uh, Yes, nobody should pointing, we call it a radiation gun, nobody should be pointing this at any human. And if you see the manufacturer's handbook, it explicitly states, do not point this at a human. Uh, my environmental health friends, engineers, they wear lead aprons and they have an exposure tag that, so that they can register how much exposure they've had over time when they use this. And uh, <laughs> So it's it's not to be played with. So so Dr. Reynolds, one of the things we talk about, and this is this is a comment from one of our, our our members in the in the webinar, and we talk about the importance of community voice, and we're just about out of time for this segment. So I want to know if you could give us a quick answer. We can come back to this later. But what can our community do to support? What are the things that we can do to help keep this in the forefront or move this agenda? Well. Uh, if the law firm kept its word, they stopped using this equipment. Uh, if you've already had the scan, uh, there's really nothing you can do. And I would not say there's inordinate worry, uh, but uh, just discourage people from signing up if they resume. There is a case July 12th. Uh, the federal court will hear my objection as well as several other Flint residents. Uh, and we'll see what the judge and the special manager in the case are moved to do. So stay tuned. Thank you, Dr. Reynolds. And I know you'll be uh, here to update us as things go forward. So let's just support Dr. Reynolds by, as he said, make sure we talk to others. And if you have an opportunity to talk with your attorney, so just share the same information that he says. This is not a good tool for humans. So uh, thank you so much. Lottie, we're going to be talking to you next. Uh, thank you, Dr. Reynolds. Lottie, if you can uh, little, tell us about updates from the city of Flint. No, there's a lot going on. The mayor is trying to make sure it happens for the city. So please give us updates from the city. So I, I, uh, thanks again for this opportunity. And I really just wanted to make sure that I pointed out a couple of things that have popped up in the conversation. One, um, masks. The city of Flint does have masks available for um, use. If you don't have any, if you need some, if you are um, a member of a church that may be opening back up and you'd like to have a stash of masks available for um, uh, members when they come, uh, feel free to give us a call at 8 10 4 10 2020 and we can we can get masks to you the city of flint also has filters we want to make sure that we remind people of the importance of using filters and also um, if, if you don't already do this flushing your water flushing involves opening the taps and letting the water run um, to remove the water that's been standing in in the lines um, and, and, and or outlet. So be sure that uh, occasionally you are, are flushing your, your um, faucets, especially those that are not uh, connected to, to filters. Um, also, the city of Flint is out doing collecting water samples. I saw um, a, a comment in the chat about someone who needed uh, to know whether or not their water was okay. Um, if you call that same number, 810-410-2020, and let them know that you um, are interested um, in, in being part of uh, the sampling, uh, they will bring a kit to your house that will give you instructions on how to use that kit. Um, and, and in some cases, uh, if you are able to provide a sample and you're, you provide it and it's a, it's a uh, one that we can actually use to meet um, our, our lead and copper rule requirements, then you'll receive a $25 uh, gift card for consumer energy. Um, if you need information on how things are going, you can go to the website, cityofflint.com slash progress report, and it'll give you a progress report on Flint water. Uh, let you know right now, current uh, water quality results. Um, the last testing standard revealed six parts per billion. Per billion. Um, federal standards is uh, 15 parts per billion or less. Um, that is updated on a pretty regular basis. So if you need uh, information on 
Flint Water and what the progress is, then by all means, stop by that website. I am happy to answer any questions that anyone has. I know we're short on time, um, but again, we are uh, here to help if you need filters, if you need masks, if you need your water tested, if you have not had your service line replaced and you still want to opt in, then give us a call, 810-410-2020. Thank you so much, Lonnie. Appreciate that, those updates. I'm glad you mentioned the mask because that was going to be one of the questions that we can get that support from the city. So we appreciate that. And don't forget those filters. Now, Lottie, both you and Dr. Reynolds talked about the water, something about the water crisis, and we are faced with COVID. And so last, in our last uh, session, uh, Afton Shavers, who works at Greater Flint Health Coalition, is responsible for recast, told us that this month, June, is PTSD, -T, B, PTSD month, which is post-traumatic stress disorder. All of us has been through a lot of trauma. And so we have asked Genesee Health System to have a representative come to us today to talk about PTSD. Lisa Bruder, from, who's a manager of education, she told us she gets excited about this topic of trauma. So we're going to let her explain why and then give us a good understanding of what this is, PTSD. Lisa, thank you welcome. so much. Thank you, thank you. So I will explain. The reason why I get excited to talk about trauma and PTSD is because without understanding trauma, we can't really understand human development. We can't understand supporting people in our community, knowing that a lot of our community and a lot of people in general, especially during COVID-19, have had an immense amount of trauma. So now in order to really understand behaviors of people, we need to see it through the lens of trauma and understand that where we've been determines where we will go. So again, my name is Lisa Bruder. I'm the manager of education at Genesee Health System. Um, and we'll jump right in. All right, so let's start with what is trauma. In order to understand post-traumatic stress disorder, we first have to break that down. So PTSD means that something happened post in, in history, and it's creating a disorder, a mental health disorder, um, because it's impacting your life. And we're going to break that down specifically here in a second. So trauma can be anything that threatens your life or physical integrity um, and causes that overwhelming sense of terror, helplessness, and horror. The most important thing to understand with trauma is it's going to be different for everyone. And so what's trauma for me may not be trauma for you and vice versa. Understanding that all of the life factors that have built up to the moment of the traumatic experience are going to determine how your brain responds and what symptoms and signs you have after that experience. Next slide, please. So some types of trauma, and again, we're not going to limit this. This is just to kind of get our brain thinking about different types of trauma that do exist in our community, but that there could be additional ones as well. So a physical or life-threatening event like domestic violence, a car accident, that sort of thing, psychological trauma, neglect, sexual assault, historical trauma, medical trauma, some school or community violence, Military trauma, of course, which is where we most often hear that term of PTSD, and we'll talk about that in a second and how we can support individuals um, who do have a military background at our agency. Traumatic grief and separation, system-induced trauma, which we, we work with a lot as far as the foster care system is going, and so we really want to create some support around our, our kiddos that are in and out of foster care and reduce the level of trauma that they're experiencing. And of course, natural disasters and war, terrorism and other political violence. So trauma can be known by a lot of different names. As we were talking beforehand, using the term PTSD or just trauma, and then it grows much bigger than that. So simple versus complex trauma. Simple trauma is going to be that one single incident. Um, it doesn't determine whether or not you will have a long lasting mental health disorder after it. It just means that there's a single event. And complex trauma is multiple events stacked on top of each other. Now, if we think of our community um, of Flint in a snapshot of the last 10 years, there has been layers of complex trauma. And when we look through that traumatic lens, instead of saying, you know, what's wrong with you? Now we can say what happened to you and really recognize the layers of Flint water crisis, COVID-19, um, different racial inequities that have been happening in our community. And so really noticing complex trauma builds up and it continues to build. We also have secondary traumatic stress, vicarious trauma and burnout. And those really connect to people who have been 
essential workers during this time period. It, it can connect to people who have positions that they endure trauma regularly. We're talking about mental health therapists, doctors, EMS, first responders. These people witness and see some very challenging things. And so through the work that they do, they're experiencing trauma that other people are enduring. And that can impact your brain as well. Toxic stress is an ongoing form of trauma that really can lead your brain to have some challenges. And so we're, to toxic stress will never be a single incident. It's a durational, slow buildup of challenges that can be exhausting for your brain. And then of course we have post-traumatic stress disorder. We're gonna break that down in just a second. Okay, so here's going to be the difference. We know that when individuals experience a traumatic event, that we're going to say you have zero to 28 days to feel, have that felt sense, experience, and, and you could have different symptoms that when scary things happen, our brain has to cope with that and sit with that. And up till 28 days, we say that's normal. When something scary happens, of course, you could have nightmares, you might feel nervous, you might feel, feel hyper aroused. But if we get to that month mark, that 28 day mark or longer, and you're still having some symptoms, that we might be working more with a disorder than just general stress that's, that's normal. These are normal reactions to an abnormal situation. So when something big and scary happens, it's okay to just give yourself grace that that first month might have some new feelings. And of course, reaching out to your support system, your mental health support system, daily practices, all that's good. When we get to that month, if you're still feeling like you're having some of those symptoms go on, we really want to talk about how we can reduce the impact to your life that these symptoms are having. Next slide, please. So we know that brain development happens from the bottom up. And I could talk about this part of it all day long, but we'll just do the basics. So when information goes into our brain, <clears throat> it begins at our spinal cord, our brainstem, limbic system, cortex, and prefrontal cortex. And so if we have some traumatic experiences that are happening, all of that thought and that experience is going to get stopped at brainstem, limbic system. It's not going to get to that good part of our front brain that makes all the good, calm, rational decisions. And so we begin to think more primitively. And let's think of our young people. It's Algebra is hard for me on a great day, but it would be really hard for me to learn algebra while my brain is is telling me to survive, watch out, there's danger around you. And so if I'm planning for danger and wondering where danger is at, it's hard to have abstract thinking and be able to participate fully with our peers and with our academic setting, <clears throat> excuse me. And it makes us think differently about the world around us. Let's go to the next slide and I'll show you a picture of what the differences might be. Oh, well here, this is the next one after this, but okay, so ex exposure derails the brain. So it puts us on constant alert for danger and it puts us in that fight, flight, or freeze. And so again, let's just use children as an example. If you're in a school setting and you've had these, these traumatic experiences throughout your life and a kiddo says, hey, like look at your shoes and you automatically think, oh, he must hate my shoes. I'm ready to fight. Whereas that kid might've been saying like, those are super rad. And so your brain is quick to think, but in a negative way. Next slide. Okay, this is the picture. I love this picture, Berenstein Bears, right? So the, the picture on the left is calm and happy. He's whistling, there's happy balloons, selling flowers, some woodland creatures. That's a neurotypical brain that likely has had very limited traumatic experiences. But the one on the right is an example of how the world changes around you. If the trauma has created your brain to function mostly in that primal space, then instead of looking at um, the person selling flowers as, this is so kind and nice to sell flowers and make the world beautiful, your brain might think, you know, there's something wrong with these flowers. This person is trying to create danger to me. Again, with the woodland creatures, they go from friendly and happy to kind of evil and ominous. And so traumatic experiences makes our brain see things differently. And we as practitioners and professionals have to help people and understand if they're irritable or not feeling so great or experiencing some of those traumatic symptoms that we say, hey, I get it. You've been through some hard stuff. Next slide, please. 
All right, so again, responses to trauma are normal reactions to abnormal events. And so we really want to normalize, reduce the stigma associated to individuals having signs and symptoms after trauma and say like, hey, this is okay. This is what happens sometimes. There's scientific reactions in your brain. It's okay. We've all been through that. So some things that they might experience are shock, denial, and disbelief confusion or difficulty concentrating, lots of challenges with short-term memory. And again, when your brain is thinking, survive, survive, watch out, that short-term memory is going to be used up in that area. Some anger, irritability, lots of anxiety. Of course, remember your brain is on alert all the time. Withdrawing from peers, feeling sad or hopeless, feeling disconnected and numb. I hear that one all the time, that I don't feel like I'm in my body. I feel numb or like I'm watching my body from an outside view. Lots of sleep challenges, having insomnia or nightmares, fatigue, being startled easy, difficulty concentrating, racing heartbeat. So again, a lot of these symptoms that we would normally identify as anxiety, we can say, okay, this person has anxiety or say, it sounds like you're experiencing anxiety. Let's think really critically about what have may happened in your life in order to experience this feeling. So that racing heartbeat, agitation, aches and pains, muscle tension, we often carry that in our shoulders and such. Um, and really feel it. And so when we have all these signs and symptoms, again, 28 days, pick a random number. You can feel these things for 28 days as you're working towards wellness and healing. If we get past that point, we want to say, let's talk about this some more. This seems to be really impacting your life. And so PTSD is broke down into four criteria. The first criteria is exposure. So we say, let's talk about what you've been through, what's happened, and, the, and could there be an experience that may have been traumatic to you and to your brain? So there's that exposure. Then we have re-experiencing, which means you're trying to go about your life and live, and you continue to have flashbacks or memories of that happening. And at times when you don't want them to pop up. Persistent avoidance. <clears throat> if you find yourself avoiding certain places or certain people that remind you of the trauma, or also if you're avoiding daily things like interacting with friends that you would normally would be around, family, that sort of thing, we're going to talk about that avoidance. And then increased arousal criteria. That's that hypervigilance. And oftentimes we might see that in kids and think, this is ADHD. And it might have symptoms very similar to ADHD. But first, we want to say, what has happened? Let's talk about your life and your history and make sure that we can work full function in our brain and some of those thoughts aren't stuck at the base in our primal instincts. So <clears throat> the wonderful thing is, and I would never want to talk about trauma or PTSD without providing some sort of hope, is that experience grows our brain. This is in no way a life sentence of terror that as a practitioner we can treat trauma and recovery is possible. And so we can form new connections. And there's lots of different therapeutic um, interventions that can work for this. And we can build in those positive supports and positive connections to change the brain development back to a healthy space. So the more that those positive experiences are repeated, the healthier and stronger those brain connections are going to be. So if we want to heal, like if, if something traumatic happens to you, we don't have to wait till that 30 day mark. Let's talk to the people around us and say, hey, we've been through a lot. So let's give our bodies grace together. We need to keep moving. Remember signs and symptoms of hard things, depression, anxiety are telling us to slow down and sit. And sometimes we have to fight back and say, keep moving, keep moving just like you would every other day. Don't isolate yourself, fight back on that feeling, stay connected to your support group. Regulate your nervous system, whatever that means to you, if that's meditating or reading, taking a hot bath, going for a walk. We want to take care of our health. And especially at a time like this, some of us have missed some doctor's appointments, dentist appointments, things that have been derailed from COVID. Let's get, get back on track and make sure our wellness is in check. And then, of course, we can seek some professional um, therapy if you're still having a difficulty. If this trauma, trauma is impacting your ability to live life at home with your family or live life at work, if you're continuing to have those symptoms, then we want to we wanna talk about it and get into a treatment that works for you. And so we say, if the trauma um, is, is taking away from your ability to live, laugh, and love, 
if you aren't able to live, laugh, and love with the people that you usually have in your circle, then maybe it's time to make that phone call. And of course, we have to mention if you're using drugs or alcohol to avoid that re-experiencing or hyperarousal, we just want individuals to recognize we, we know that battle. We battle, that battle of escaping a feeling and feeling calm for a moment, but those will only prolong that feeling. So if we work through it through a professional setting, you're less likely to have compounded issues with drugs and alcohol later on. So at Genesee Health System, we do have a veterans navigate, navigator. His name is Eduardo Calzada. And you can reach Genesee Health System through one phone number all the time. Anything you're looking for for mental health in the community, you can contact us. It'll be on the next slide as well. So just a second. Um, we'll give you that phone number. Thank you. 257-3740. That's our customer service line. When you call that line, there is a um, care specialist that's going to talk to you about, hey, what can I help you with? We can just talk about the system. We can talk about your care needs. Of course, there's a huge spectrum of things. We do have a 24 seven now um, behavioral health urgent care. So at any time, if someone is struggling, you can have face-to-face -face virtual chat with a mental health professional to talk about some of those struggles. Um, that person will be able to put you in touch with Eduardo. Customer service can put you in touch with Eduardo, Eduardo if this is a, a veterans navigation concern. And then anyone else in the community, regardless of income, regardless of health insurance, regardless of anything in the world, if you need help, GHS is here to support people. There are no more treatment um, barriers to who we can serve. We can support everyone in our community with a huge variety of services. And then also we have that text Flint to 741741. We found that that works really well for young people. Um, and we can post those flyers all over or give you flyers for your organization as well. And we do community outreach. So if you want to take mental health first aid, that's an awesome class. It's eight hours. You get a certification at the end to teach you all about how to respond to a mental health crisis. Any complaints, concerns, questions about our systems, please reach out to us. We want to be a huge support in the community and continue to connect with people who need our support. So I know that was super fast, but if anyone has any other interest, my name is Lisa Bruder, and you can call that same number, 257-3740. Connect with me, and I'd love to further this conversation as well. Thank you, Lisa. And I think we'll be hearing, hearing more from you because you pointed out some really significant things. And one of the things that you really mentioned is that multiple traumas. And of course, we're, we're here talking about COVID. We've talked about the water crisis and other things. We talked about the health inequity. So we have these layers of trauma. And one of the things we want to do is reduce the stigma of talking about our mental wellness. Yes, so we'll look absolutely. forward to having you back again with that enthusiasm about trauma. So I would love if to. you have questions, we'd like people to put their questions in the Q&A and you'll be here to answer them for you even today. So thank absolutely. you again, Lisa. Yes, um, and we you. talk about we talk about the importance of community voice. So we want to charge, we want to provide you with ammunition. And one of the ways we've been able to do that is through our policy briefer. And so Dr. Deborah for Holden is leading the team at MSU. She's not with us today taking some much needed R&R, &R, but her capable assistant, I call her, her understudy, uh, Mary Catherine, is here to give us the update on the equity brief. Mary Catherine. Yes, thanks. Thanks, Yvonne. So if anyone has any questions, shoot me an email, craWf457 at msu.edu. And just because it's always, we always run tight at the end, I'm just going to hop right to it. Um, so thanks for having me back. We've covered the news that cases, you know, have declined for the sixth consecutive week. So we're down 61% in Genesee County and 51% in Flint. Um, and I know Sherelle mentioned our testing positivity rate is once again below 5%. So uh, this is just so wonderful as we continue to get shots in arms. So let's take a look at the data by race groups. Um, on that next slide. And I just wanna bring your attention back to the trends. So as you'll see, um, if you take a look at the bright red bar, as case counts decrease, our amazing colleagues at the Genesee County Health Department are able to resolve that missing data. And um, as you heard Dr., um, from Dr. Hacker earlier, they're actually able to determine that the missing data in Genesee County are actually more likely to belong to um, white residents rather than to other groups. So this is really amazing news as we continue to track the progress of uh, COVID health disparities. Um, and then on the next slide, you're, um, you can see what geographic spread looked like 
from uh, the month of April to May. So it does look like I cut a little bit of my graph off at the bottom. Um, but so for those who haven't received the equity briefing yet, that teal green shows us the case rates of each municipality um, from the month of April. And then the blue just below shows us the case rates from the month of May. So as you can see, Genesee County has really done just an incredible job across the board of getting vaccinated and getting um, and just doing our personal responsibilities uh, to, to get things under control. And I, of course, want to draw your attention to the city of Flint standing strong. So recall that last month, Flint was about ninth. Um, when it came to new cases and we're right now uh, for the month of May, we're, we're about uh, in the 12th position. So we are hanging in tight. Um, I just want to keep these trends going so that uh, Dr. Froholden uh, has some good news to share when she comes back. Um, and so with that, I'm just going to kick right off into recommendations. So <clears throat> I want to be very clear. Uh, policymakers need to kill Senate Bill 460 while it's in committee. Uh, this bill uh, limits discussions, it's seeking to limit discussions in classrooms of how racism has shaped the history of the US and you know, modern institutions. Um, and if teachers or school districts um, were refused, they would actually lose 5% of funding. And I just have to point out that this type of political meddling uh, especially in which school funding is used as a game to implement an uh, quote unquote anti-racist curriculum actually furthers racism and oppression as the sponsors of this legislation have intended. Um, so this is the time for citizens to speak up and for policymakers to listen. Kill this bill. Um, I highly encourage you to read a piece that was attached in this brief. I will go ahead and put it in the, in the chat as well by Dr. Dorinda Carter Andrews, an MSU professor who has a lot of good answers to many, many questions relative to this proposed legislation and the background and the backgrounds of this effort. Um, and then I'll, let, let me just hop right can, to our uh, next. Mary okay. Catherine, quickly before you leave there, when you say kill the Senate bill, what do you actually mean by that? Do you what mean? I'm, yeah, what I mean is so right now it has been heard by, by the Senate and if it continues to move forward, it'll keep going down that legislative process. But if the committee that this bill was referred to refuses to schedule a hearing for it because they don't like the content, because they don't support it, then that bill will die right there. It will not move forward in the legislative process. It'll stall out and right and would have to would have to, you know, start from from ground zero. Thank um, you. Yes, absolutely. Um, so our next the next thing I wanted to just really quickly um, talk about is Michigan's uh, the 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 uh, the Michigan Economic Jumpstart Plan, I'm sorry. So we're just asking policymakers again to set aside partisanship to the maximum extent possible to allocate relief funding um, for Governor Whitmer's proposed initiatives to pay working families a livable wage, expand access to childcare as Gary unpacked and invest more into small businesses. So I will leave it there because um, I know that the time, so I'm gonna leave it there. <laughs> Thank you, Mary yes. Catherine. We, I, I did ask you to, to help us with that one item there. So thank you so yes. much. But we want to appreciate what you've done and what you're doing. We want to ask our community health workers and our social workers, please continue to apply for those continued education units and the social work credits. We've given you the information on how to do that. This is so very, very important because again, here, your voice has made this possible and we want to make sure that you're benefiting from it. So select your occup occupation and then hit that submit to successfully complete your survey. We also want to remind you to like us on Facebook. Um, we have many, many listeners that come and participate in this and we want to continue that. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Healthy Flint. And of course, email any questions at info at hfrcc.org. Any questions to info at hfrcc.org 
or you can always call us at 810-835-2130. We are so excited that we're able to bring this to you every week, the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center's community webinar on coronavirus. It is because you have made it clear that this information benefits you. Tune in again next week. We'll be right back here to share with you on this webinar. Thank you for attending today.